Lathoretta Krishnan, clinical pharmacist at the University of Illinois Cancer Center in Illinois, will now deliver our Clinical Corner presentation sponsored by Bayer. This month's Clinical Corner presentation is on Stavarga for metastatic colorectal cancer. Latha. Thank you, Stephen, for the introduction, as many, and many thanks to ENCODA for inviting me to speak and to Bayer for sponsoring the presentation. Many of you will find some of the information presented today as a review, given that Stavarga or Regorafenib isn't a recent approval by any means. However, I hope to engage you all in a reboost of vintage information, as well as introduce some relatively new data. Uh, next slide. Okay, so let's start off with a quick overview of metastatic colorectal cancer, which I will now refer to as MCRC. As on oncology pharmacists, I think this is a cancer that we all have some good experience with, given it's the third most diagnosed cancer type, and unfortunately, the second leading cause of cancer-related deaths, with the 2019 stats showing new cases as an estimated 140,000 or so, and deaths as uh, 50,000 patients. The average risk is one in 20 patients, but this is all dependent on risk factors. And so for the purposes of time, um, I've listed those risk factors there, and I think we're all familiar with those. Um, those can be lifestyle risk factors as well as genetics plays a part in colorectal cancer. While 90% of new cases occur in patients that are older than 50, the recommended screening or colonoscopy has changed relatively recently to 45 uh, years of age. In my years of practice, it is sad, it's sadly hard to forget those 35 to 45 year old patients with mets everywhere because it just wasn't on anyone's radar due to their young age. While early stages of ARC are curable with surgery and perhaps adjuvant chemotherapy and other modalities, the treatment of MR MCRC is still challenging with systemic treatment being the backbone. When you look at the five-year survival after diagnosis for overall CRC, it is 65%. Unfortunately, while there have been many advances in the treatment for MCRC, the five-year survival is still a dismal 14%. Next slide, Stephen. Okay, so this slide is very, it's a very, very basic overview of systemic treatment in MCRC. Uh, for more details, we can obviously refer to guidelines. We know that initial treatment is often a combination of various chemotherapeutic agents with or without targeted therapies, depending on gene mutations, specifically KRAS and BRAF. When I first started in practice, it seemed like one size fits all, but now we know that we are definitely, we are identifying Predictive biomarkers and therapies are becoming more individualized. Immunotherapy has made its way into the systemic treatment options and MCRC in patients displaying uh, deficient or microsatellite instability. While this is a conversation that could be a clinical corner on its own, I will be speaking to a study looking at microsatellite patients receiving immunotherapy or regorafenib in the next few slides, so stay tuned. If we look at NCC guidelines, is very in a very simplistic and brief summary, we see that initial therapy starts off with you know, at least a 5 few base regimen listed in the bullet points. Um, no one is preferred over the other. So if you have a patient with inflammatory bowel disease, the provider may pick full FOX over full theory due to the iron and TCAN component. And similarly, if we have a patient that has diabetes or is a guitarist, the provider may pick full theory as the initial regimen over full FOX due to the oxaliplatin component. There is also no preference for biological agents if indicated. So for example, either Vectavix or Herbitox can be used if indicated. The rule of thumb with MCOC is to start off with intensive first line or perhaps second line therapy, which includes multiple agents, then move to less intensive therapy. As with most cancer types, sequencing is always a challenge and there are limited studies to guide clinicians in this area. So we refer to guidelines, comorbid disease states, performance status, and so on. Next slide, Stephen. So this leads us to where does Stavarga fit in in the landscape of MCRC? So this slide really serves as a brief review, and I think most of us have this experience with Stavarga. So I'm just going to um, just you know briefly 
indicate that, you know, Stavarga is for patients that have received standard therapy. Um, and, you know, the starting dose uh, or the standard starting dose is 160 milligrams for the first 21 days of a 28 day cycle. And again, I'll, I'll leave the slide. Um, the slide will be available uh, when they post it to the ENCODA site. Next slide, Stephen. So as we know, Stavarga is a multi-kinase inhibitor or a dirty kinase that touches, touches upon uh, various signaling pathways to ultimately elicit its anti-tumor activities. It hit, hits up on prevention of metastases by blocking VEGF receptors 2 and 3, as well as platelet-derived growth factor receptors. Stavarga has an effect on tumor angiogenesis or the development of new blood vessels to the tumor by blocking VEGF receptors. TI2 and other receptors. It works on oncogenesis and blocking protein kinases such as KIT, RAC1, and RET. And lastly, it has been shown to disrupt tumor immunity by inhibiting uh, colony stimulating factor one, which is involved in macrophage uh, proliferation. The bottom line here is that it hits upon many different mechanisms to prevent tumor growth and metastases. And from this slide, you can truly see that Stavarga is a novel TKI, hitting upon so many receptors in multiple signaling pathways, which again leads us to its anti-tumor effects. Next slide, Stephen. So I'd like to move forward uh, to briefly reviewing the known Stavarga studies that have displayed efficacy in MCRC. The correct trial that we all know, perhaps like the back of our hand, has led to the drug's approval. This was a phase randomized placebo-controlled trial. Um, 760 patients were randomized in a two-to-one fashion to receive either Stavarga, 160 milligrams daily uh, for three weeks, then one week off, plus best supportive care or placebo, plus best supportive care. Patients were continued on treatment until progression of disease or unacceptable toxicity. So this was a study that involved many countries and four different continents, and they had to receive all standard therapies that were currently approved at the time in 2010. The second trial I would like to touch upon is the phase three trial, CONQUER, which, with, which had similar inclusion criteria, um, which they had to have standard therapies, but this study differed in that it was a smaller trial with a total of a little over 200 patients. It was also a trial performed in Asian patients only who progressed after standard therapy similar to the correct trial. Another major difference between this trial and the correct trial is that the patients did not have to receive a prior anti-VEGF or anti-EGFR therapy prior to randomization. Um, that was not included in the inclusion criteria. Next slide, Stephen. Okay, so here are the results of the trial. Again, this is probably review for most of you, but looking at the primary endpoint um, for the correct trial, you do see that there's a statistically significant difference here with regorafenib of 6.4 months versus placebo. Um, performance, uh, progression-free survival, there's also a difference here, 1.9 versus 1.7 in placebo. And then moving on to the CONQUER trial, please note that 40% of patients did not receive a prior anti-VEGF or an anti-EGFR before randomization. So keep this in mind as we review the data. Um, here again, you do see that um, overall survival benefit with regorafenib as well as the, as well as the PFS uh, benefit here. There were no new safety signals reported with the CONQUER trial, and so that I think is important to note as well. Next slide. Let's talk about safety. So in general, we've gotten much of our safety data from the phase three trials, correct and concord. In addition, a large uh, perspective open label phase three B trial, uh, the consigned trial, which had close to 3000 patients assess safety as their primary objective and there were no new safety signals identified. So it's nice to have that additional data here. Um, this is a summary and I think we're all again familiar with this data, but um, you know, as we're all dealing with all these oral oncolytics and IV oncolytics, it's nice to refer to a table. Um, it's hard to keep this all in our mind and so definitely making sure that we're going back um, to the package insert and referring to this. Next slide. So I'd like to switch gears and discuss the Emblaze 370 trial. As many of you know, microsatellite instability or MSI, which is a genetic mutation 
mutation resulting from DNA mismatch repair has come into play in colorectal cancer. So patients are now screened for microsatellite status, and if there is a microsatellite instability, patients may be able to receive immunotherapy, specifically a PD-1 inhibitor, plus or minus uh, ipilimumab. So in the EMBLAZE trial, um, previously treated patients with MCRC that had known microsatellite status were included in an intention to treat patient population, and they were randomized in a two to one to one fashion to receive atezolizumab um, at a lower dose every two weeks, plus uh, uh, Cotelic, um, which is a MEK1, MEK2 inhibitor. So combination therapy or atezolizumab at the standard dosing at Q3 weeks or regorafenib standard dosing. And the primary endpoint here was overall survival. Next slide, Stephen. Okay, so the results of the Emblaze 370 study are here. The results were presented at ESMO World GI Congress 2018. And these are the results of 363 patients that were randomized. So important to note on this slide is that um, when you look at the microsatellite status um, and you're evaluating that, 91.7% of patients had micro, microsatellite stable or microsatellite instable low. Um, and then it's important to note that there, was, uh, there were a percentage of patients that had missing microsatellite status. So when you look at the primary endpoint, the combination therapy of the PD-1 plus uh, Cotelic, um, you had nine point, uh, sorry, 8.9 months versus 8.5 months with regorafenib, um, which was not statistically significant. Um, and so the objective response uh, rates are listed here, and I'm quickly going over this in, in, uh, with time in mind. With regards to treatment-related toxicities, the combination therapy, you had 45% versus regorafenib, 49%. So the bottom line here is atezolizumab plus uh, Cotelic and atezolizumab monotherapy did not demonstrate a statistically significant overall survival benefit versus regorafenib. So the primary endpoint was not met in this trial. Next slide. Another um, relatively new study that um, has come into our practices is the REDOS study. Um, and this was a phase two trial where they randomized patients um, into four different uh, groups here, and there's two different arms. So they're randomized in a one-to-one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one -to -one fashion where they either received in arm A, regorafenib um, at low dose or escalating doses um, with uh, in arm, 1A uh, preemptive strategy to treat Palmer plantar, and they use clobetazole uh, for um, preemptive treatment. And then that, the only difference with uh, arm A2 is that it was a reactive strategy in using um, the cream uh, for Palmer plantar. And then in arm B, they compared it to patients with standard regorafenib therapy with the three weeks on, one week off, uh, there. So on the right-hand side of the slide, you can see how they started the escalating doses in arm A, where week one was at 80, then week two was at 120, and then week three at 160, and then of course week four there was no dosing. Here the primary endpoint was the number of patients finishing cycle two at eight weeks. Next slide. So looking at the results, um, we're looking at, again, the primary endpoint of per percentage of patients finishing cycle two in two weeks with intentions of starting cycle three. So when you look at the escalating doses where they started 80 milligrams and they ended at um, the 160, you've got a higher percentages of patients at 43% versus the standard dose of 24% finishing uh, cycle two in eight weeks. So here in the redose trial, the primary endpoint was met. Next slide. So identifying patients for Stavarga, I think again, we do have experience with this. Um, it has been available and on the market. And when I think about our patients at the University of Illinois, we obviously know that they have had to have completed um, standard chemotherapy or therapy. Um, but when I think of patients that, you know, these that are good for, you know, good patients for Stavarga. I think about patients that have received full Fox or full Fury, um, standard chemotherapy that have 
experienced hematological toxicities where we've had to dose reduce or had to use something like Nulast or Nupigen. So these are patients that perhaps would benefit from using Stravarga um, versus perhaps some of the other treatments available. Obviously, you know, these are oral oncolytics, so you want patients that are adherent. And so, you know, identifying these patients early on is very important because keeping in mind, most of the previous uh, treatments are IV regimens. Good performance status, of course, is something in, in the trials, they looked at patients with performance status of zero and one. And then again, with oral oncolytics, we want these patients to have excellent communication skills, specifically with healthcare providers, um, so that they're letting us know if they're experiencing any toxicities. Next slide. So I'm kind of rushing over here, but um, with takeaway points, um, I think we know that regorafenib efficacy has been validated and we have shown here that it's been uh, validated in the correct and the concord trials. We know that there's adverse events and many of us have dealt with this um, and we know that it requires frequent monitoring and dose reductions might be required. We also know, I think, as a clinical pearl that hand, foot, skin reactions are painful. Um, it's something that patients may or may not understand because this may be the first time they're experiencing this. So counseling these patients up front, explaining to them not to be afraid to tell us if they're even experiencing a little bit of this pain and just this discomfort up front so that we can manage this and identify it before we have to dose reduce um, or before we have to really make a decision there. Um, and then again, the primary endpoint of the redose uh, study was met. And here, you know, this has been included in the NCCN guidelines, so that's important to note. And so this is a dose escalation that can be employed um, in patients and should be considered. And with that, I will take any questions. Thanks again, Latha. Uh, what we'll do uh, in the interest of time is we'll have members submit questions either through the Q&A box or chat box, and we will follow up with them uh, via email at a, later, at a later date. So thank you again, Latha.